We've been in a series called The Growing Christian, and we've been in the book of 2 Peter. And 2 Peter, we, we see uh, we're in chapter 2, we're going to be going through verses 9 through 22. And the title of this message, it's kind of a part two, is Espionage in the Kingdom. So the growing Christian, 2 Peter, we've outlined it by chapter. So if you guys could draw your attention to the screen, we have three chapters that we've been zeroing in on. And the first chapter, um, Peter kind of helps us focus on being diligent in our walk with Jesus and pursuing wisdom for this growing Christian, that's you and I, in pursuit of holiness. Chapter 2, the chapter that we're in and we were in last week is this warning for growing Christians about heresy in the church at that time and in this time as well. And of course, next week we'll be looking at the desire, um, this deep well for the growing Christian, deep well of water, um, this Christian in, in hopes of the return of Jesus Christ. So those three are what we've gone through so far. And uh, let me expand on those a little bit and zero in on it. Then we're going to be jumping into um, chapter 2 of, uh, of uh, Second Peter. So review part 1 is, chapter 1 is diligence and the wisdom for the growing Christian and um, diligently seeking and pursuing Jesus. And uh, one of the things that you want to do as a believer, four words that we've employed, and these four words we can really, if you're, if you're serious about Growing in your walk with Jesus, this is a simple method of pursuing that. One is you've got to plan for it because you're not going to grow unless you make the specific purpose of planning for growing in Jesus. Then you want to process it. You want to say, okay, a lot of times is, well, there's 66 books in the Bible. I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 1. You're going to get lost. Perhaps you talk with someone about it, help you to, to focus on the direction to go. Maybe you just, you focus on 2 Peter. You read that 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 times. Next is it's personal. Now, not everybody who can read through the Bible once a year or read the Bible four times a year, um, it, 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 maybe that's not you. Maybe you want to start out slow. So you want to make it personal. You want to have it fit your personality. And then, of course, it wants to be practical. You want to make sure you commit to it, but you don't overcommit. You don't raise the bar so high that you set goals that you know you're just not going to be able to achieve. And then, of course, um, chapter 2. And that was chapter 1. In chapter 2, um, we see this danger, this warning for the Christians of false teachers and false prophets. And um, I, I think that, unfortunately, it's, it's way worse than, than, you, than, you, than you know, that, or most of you know. Uh, I read, uh, I read a, a, an article yesterday that talked about evangelical pastors in America and that, like, I think it was, I'm, I'm not going exactly, because it just stuck in my brain, it's coming out now, is like one-third of the pastors don't believe you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God, and that they, they, they dismiss um, the claims of Jesus. And that's not just your, your you know, fringe um, pastors, it's the ones that are closer to the, the, the concentric circle. So things are not good. And we're, here's what happens is this danger just, it spills out in all, all, all the New Testament. It does in the, New, the, the Old Testament as well. But, but if you consider some of the dangers, some of the warnings that um, these guys who love Jesus and, and want us to be really shrewd. See, we want to be shrewd as vipers, the scriptures say, but we want to be innocent while we're being shrewd. Now, Paul says this in Romans chapter 16, verses, second part of 17 and verse 18, the NLT. He says this. I don't, do we have, did I, did I put them? So, so anyway, so it says, watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interest. By smooth talk and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. And then um, in Acts chapter 20, we have, therefore, it says, therefore, take heed, actually, actually verses 20 to 28 to 30, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. For I know this, this again, this is Paul, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Who's the flock? It's you and I. 
Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking not just crazy things, but perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. John also has a warning for the growing Christian. He talks about false prophets. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the Amplified Version says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit speaking through a self-proclaimed prophet prophet. Instead, test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets and teachers have gone out into the world. Jude also warns growing Christians about false prophets, and we know that Jude is the brother of James, which connects them to Jesus, so he's also the half-brother of Jesus, and he says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, those speaking through self-proclaimed prophets. Instead, test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets and teachers have gone out into the world. So, finally, Jesus also has a thing or two to say about warning growing Christians. He says this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. He says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves, and, uh, which is you know, ravenous wolves, and you will know them by their fruits. Amen. So that's what Peter is doing today. He is warning us. And of course, Peter is 30 years removed from watching Jesus ascend into heaven. So 30 years have gone by. Um, He is a a scarred, powerful man of God, having understood all the trials and difficulties that come with living life. And he is, he's ministering to the flock of God. And of course, he uses the word Uh, destructor, destructive, or destruction five times in chapter two alone. So he recognizes heretics. He recognizes those who want to bring havoc in the kingdom of God, and he knows and understands. And um, he, he says, really, ultimately, so I know that most of us, when we come and listen to a message, we want to say, well, how does that affect me? How does that relate to me? How, how can that mean anything to me whatsoever? So if there's one thing that you can do is you need to really be shrewd and know and understand the false prophets that are in this world. Some of them are really easy to spot from my perspective. So for example, if I say, hey, look, I, I've got a, you know, a $400 million airplane I want to buy and, you know, unless you give, you're going to be struck down by the Lord. I mean, you say, and I say, oh, that's an easy one. However, there are people who give, so people are being fooled. But some of the ones that aren't so easy to spot, I I think really, um, it's just, Peter wants us to see it. So what he's going to do, he's going to share with us just how you're able to do that and the significance of it. So um, the first part of the message was the destructive heresies of false teachers, this espionage in the kingdom. Uh, We caught up in verses 1 through 3, and uh, what we learned was people won't want to hear the truth. People don't want to hear the truth. That is the problem. Can you guys say that's the problem? And so Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when uh, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, um, they will heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall turn to fables. So we, we want to make sure that we recognize smooth talkers. And when, you know, it's okay to be encouraged. It's okay to be motivated. It's okay to, to know and understand that you're loved by God and you can you know, take on the world for Jesus. However, if you're not warned like Peter does here, then you, you're going to perhaps slip into um, becoming vulnerable to the enemy. So a solution is um, get wisdom. And the first nine chapters of Proverbs is directed to young people, um, teaching them how to grow. Um, and in Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you want to get wisdom, if I want to get wisdom, the first place we got to start is we got to have this reverential fear for the living God and knowledge of the Holy One. Um, so of course, another solution is to get God's Word deep inside your mind and your heart. Because scriptures, and in 2 Timothy says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete. I want to be complete, don't you? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
So 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, it, it clearly says, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time. Their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. So these teachers have these um, exploited methodologies. They're, they're, they're taking money from people. They're fleecing the flock of God for personal gain. And uh, many of you have either heard of someone that has been, quote-unquote, fleeced, or you've been in churches where um, it's hyper um, prosperity. You know, I know God wants us all to be prosper, prosperous of all things, but hyper prosperity um, teaching can lead to really, really painful disappointment because when something's connected with, hey, if you give, then God's going to bless you abundantly and then pressure to give and pressure to give and pressure to give. That's why we don't pressure to give because that's not... That's not and God's not moving in somebody's heart to feel pressured or to feel guilty. And we don't want that, but that we've seen that over the years. So the destructive heresies of false teachers indeed is real. And then we looked at doom of false teachers that we, le- we learned up last week as well um, in verses 4 through 11. And we discussed the three kinds of doom. So, so Peter gets into these significant warnings that this is what happens to false teachers because he's speaking primarily to leaders in the church, but it's a circular letter, so everybody gets it. So the first warning was that the angels were thrown from heaven into the abyss. These, these angels perish, and they're set aside. They're so wicked. They're so brutal. They're so nasty. They're so wicked that they, um, they were set aside until, I think it's Revelation chapter 9, they're going to be released. But we know that these angels are just bad news, and and the third of the angels were thrown out of heaven along with um, Satan himself. So the doom of false teachers indeed is real. The second warning he gave is found in is basically the ancient world. It came with a flood in Noah's day. And we learn in Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent and thoughts of the heart was evil continually. And of course, we, pick, we jump back into 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, says that, and did not spare the ancient world. This is Peter saying, this is what God did to wickedness. God, God is long-suffering, but he did not um, spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. So for 120 years, Noah is saying, repent, God's going to deal with your wickedness. Repent, God's going to deal with your wickedness. Repent, God's going to deal with your wickedness. And people kept on saying, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. And uh, what's he going to do? God closed up the ark, and the floods came, and you, you, you know what happened. The third warning, again, the doom of false teachers indeed is real. So this is how God dealt with it in the past. So you know God's going to deal with it again in the future because God is not mocked. It says the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, they were basically, Lot was spared from this massive fire. There's no evidence. It was basically burned to a crisp, and there's no even evidence, no archaeological evidence that ever existed. So we looked at... Verse, chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, and it says, And the turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So the scriptures are loaded with warnings. Say, hey, look, don't do this or this is going to happen. Don't do this or this is going to happen. So we need to recognize that God is going to deal with wicked uh, men and women in this world. And he said, he, and he delivered, or he rescued righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for the right, righteous man dwelling among them was tormented, or he was vexed, his righteous soul from day to day, seeing and hearing the lawless deeds. And then, of course, um, if you zero in on verse 7 of chapter 2, it says, filthy conduct of the wicked. So the history of Sodom and Gomorrah is rampant wickedness, namely of that of homosexuality. So we know that homosexuality is something that's okay these days where we live, but I don't shoot the messenger. The scriptures say God dealt with it severely in this place called Sodom and Gomorrah. So don't worry. Um, God's justice is coming. And if you don't think it's um, coming fast and really hard, I mean, uh, I want to love everybody, but I also want to protect the people that I love and children, namely, so when you have someone, a male person dressed up like a female and having this hour at school on Sunday, I got a problem with that. So I see rampant wickedness and that kind of behavior. So we just, it's, God's going to deal with it. He's going to deal with it. 
Theos. Does that mean I, I can't love people like that? Heck no, that's, just, that's not it at all. I just got the history book that tells me God deals with that kind of stuff. Romans 13, 14 tells me also, it says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. First Thessalonians. Paul says in chapter 4, for this is the will of God that you be sanctified, in other words, set apart from your sin, that you abstain and back away from sexual immorality. So the three examples that we learned, and this is where we're going to, this is where we picked, this is where we left off from last week, and this is where we're going to pick up today in verse 9. God did not spare the angels. He threw them out of heaven and threw them into the abyss. God did not spare Noah. Um, he sent a flood. God did not spare uh, people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He sent fires really bad. So that's where we're going to pick up today, and we're going to look at the doom of false teachers continued in uh, verses 9 through 11. So if you could follow along with me, that's where I'm at, 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9. You know what? I'm going to pray again. Father, we come to you again in Jesus' name, and Lord, we're picking up where we left off last week right now. So I pray that you might illuminate the scriptures. I pray, pray that my church family here would be blessed by the reading of your word and the, uh, the, the, the way it can move in our hearts and minds. I pray that they're encouraged and also uh, learn how to be, or desire to learn how to be more shrewd, and uh, Lord, but not so much so that they're, 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 they're fearful of everything from left and right and north and south and up and down. I know, Lord, that you're the God who can cover us and protect us from the wickedness. So let us not worry about it, but let us continue to fight the good fight and not grow weary in doing well as you illuminate your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said... All right, so the doom of false teachers continued. Then the Lord knows, in verse 9, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Now, if you think about it, um, those three examples we just gave, um, the first were one-third of the angels were thrown out of heaven, but there were two-thirds left behind, yeah. right? And then we saw that um, Noah on the ark... Hundreds and maybe thousands of people didn't get on the ark, but eight were saved. So God knows how to save. And then Lot was rescued, and his wife looked back, and she turned to a pillar of salt. But Lot's family was, for the most part, saved. So God knows how to pull people out in the nick of time. So that's exactly what we're talking about. And then I think that will be the same. That's a, a, a solid Argue, argument for the miraculous removal of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and this thing called harpazo. Let me use that word first, the Greek word, which means actually the transliteration in Latin, a.k.a. Um, rapture, is exactly what I believe is going to happen. Now, I'm not going to go to the hill on it. I won't argue with you about it. You might believe in mid-trib or post-trib or whatever else you believe, but I, but I believe that God's going to remove His bride so that uh, the world gets can uh, have whatever's going to happen, happen. And we did a study in, in uh, the book of Revelation. We went through the whole entire book of Revelation for an entire year. And uh, people were saying, praise God, but they were saying, thank goodness we got through that book. <laughs> Second, Peter is so much easier. Paul, Paul writes this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and he warns, warns about this great apostasy in the end days. And again, this is helping us to be shrewd. And uh, I'll read from the screen here. It says, But the Holy Spirit explicitly and unmistakably declares that in the latter times some will turn away from the faith, paying attention instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons, uh, misled by the hypocrisy of liars, whose consciences are seared with a branding iron, leaving them incapable of ethical functioning, who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from certain kinds of foods which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and have a clear knowledge of the truth. If you recognize anything in this at all, um, perhaps there's a church that forbids getting married. Has anybody, anybody heard of that before? The church that forbids people getting married? Uh, let me help you out. It's the Catholic church. They say, no, you can't be married. And then, of course, for a while there, I think they stopped do doing this. They forbid people to eat meat on Friday. You could have only fish. So... Is this pointing to them? Yes. yes, it is, the Catholic Church. Okay, thank you, Jean. Yeah. Well, but they still do the Lent. They still do the Lent. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so the doom of false teachers is real. Verse 10 says this, And especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lusts of uncleanness and despise... Um, 
if we look at this as cataphronio, um, an arrogant scoffing of authority. So Peter finishes this run-on sentence. By the way, um, my, my wife says I have run-on sentences. Does anybody know what a run-on sentence is? You know what that is? It's like when, you, when your sentence is like five paragraphs long and there's finally a period on the end of it. Punctuation. So, so Peter started this sentence in verse 4. And this is verse 10, the first part of it. Complete run-on sentence, but this is a scholarly document given by God. So there are, um, you know, some forgiveness there. So, so this is what it says. Now, now I want to, I want to make sure I address this, so that you might sort sort it out as the God as God re- reveals to you. It says this uncleaning, despising authority. Now, the King James Version says government. And, and let me share something with you. I, I'll, I, I go to the King James Version anytime I have a question of something because I think that's the standard. It's super powerful. I love the New King James Version because what ends up happening is the King James Version will say some words and you have to say, well, what that means is this. So the New King James Version did that for him. But I go back and you see the word government there as opposed to authority. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't be engaged in the political process. Amen? Amen. But I know this, that our constitutional republic is at risk. Perhaps it's on the top of the slide, just about ready to get pushed over in a steep, slippery slope into what could be a dictatorship, and God knows what else might happen. But God, I, I, I know that we have to be wise at how we communicate with others in our frustrations. Because you guys know the political process we're in right now, we're a little bit frustrating. I'm pretty sure some of you get that and you know you understand that. And I think that if we're not careful, if we're not shrewd as believers, we forget history because the propaganda machine in Germany took Romans 13 and twisted it and contorted it, and people would just do anything. And they wouldn't stand up for um, really what was right. They were smelling uh, the smoke of human beings being burned, and they were ignoring it because someone said, Romans 13 says you need to obey the government. So there is a place and there is a time when we have to rebuke that kind of unrighteousness. And the day could very well come sooner than later. Amen? So the second part of verse 10, they are these false teachers, presumptuous, self-willed, arrogant, despising the majesty of the Lord. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, basically. Um, that, if you look at that word dignitaries, you'll find that some would think that it is angels, fallen angels, these, or, or the glorious unseen world that we live in. Now, you guys know that we live in an unseen world. There's a whole lot going on spiritually that we have no idea that's going on, but we know we, we know it's going on because we're affected by it quite a bit, right? So this unseen world, not to um, be arrogant and, and, and they're not afraid to speak of them, which is kind of dumb. Um, whereas angels who are greater or superior in power and might do not bring a reviling or a defaming accusation against them before the Lord. So let me shine maybe a little bit brighter light on this verse. I'm going to go to the New Living Translation. It has a kind of built in commentary on those two verses. The second part of 10 again it says, He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings, more likely fallen angels, without so much as trembling. But the angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against the supernatural beings. Now, if you consider Jude, the brother of James, half-brother of Jesus, of course, precisely, he says, he says precisely the same thing and adds a little bit to it. He actually adds an element of, um, it, it answers the question, perhaps, of what Peter's saying here. This is what he says in Jude um, 8, verses, um, yeah, ver- verses 8 through 10. Um, it says, In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives and defy authority and scoff at supernatural beings, these glorious ones or fallen angels. But even Michael, you know, he's an archangel, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. 
so he took the place. Th- this took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. You guys remember that? But these people scoff at these things. And they do not understand. He's talking again about these false teachers who come with such power and authority, but it's dangerous. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. So we have uh, something we can learn from that, and that is we have to be really careful about how we try to push around um, wickedness in high places, that if we don't implore the Lord to sick them, (laughs) then we really risk. And that's what he's saying here. They arrogantly think they can just push and boss them. Um, you know, we, we have authority, no question about it, but he just showed us how to be careful with that kind of authority. So the doom of false teachers is indeed real, and we must make a decision to pursue our relationship with the Lord. So um, we saw the destructive heresies of false teachers in verses 1 and 3. We saw the doom of false teachers in verses 4 through 11. Now we're going to look at the depravity of of false teachers in verses 12 through 17. If you could join me as we look at verse 12. It says, But these false teachers, like natural brute beasts, a.k.a. animals, made to be caught and destroyed, basically by means of corruption, speak evil of these things, and they do not understand. They're unreasoned. You can't reason with them. And will utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, some of you know this guy by the name of Dr. Um, J. Vernon McGee. I, I was going to try to imitate him this morning because he's kind of a he's a he's a country guy, but the guy's a genius. He's just brilliant. So I think I'm going to try to imitate. Does anybody know J. Vernon McGee, the Bible bus? <laughs> Five years through the Bible, he's 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 gone. But um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna give it a give it a try. Through, no. This side says yes. Yeah, I won't do it. Okay, here we go. This is yes, yeah, positive, positive, positive peer pressure. Get, there we go. So, these apostates are like wild animals. We hear a great deal today about man descending from an animal, but both the Old and New Testament make it very clear that man is capable of living lower than the animals. He's not descended from anything. He's right down with them if you please, and lives like an animal. How'd I do? (laughs) Yeah, all right, good. That guy is awesome, man. I I look at his commentary fairly regularly. Pray for me. Verse 13, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those counted a pleasure to carouse, to revel in the daytime, basically living flamboyantly, enticing others. They are spots, basically like stains in a nice, clean white fabric, and blemishes on mankind, carousing or reveling in their own deceptions while they feast with you. So Peter's saying, these guys are in your midst, and some of you aren't recognizing how bad these dudes are. They're wicked. They have no place in your church. That's where you want to say, out of here. And uh, they're going to receive wages or they're going to re- a reward for their unrighteousness. Basically, in their destroying, they will be destroyed. And these uh, reprobate false teachers are arrogant, they're self-righteous, they're takers, um, horrible motives, feasting, and just, just, they're just, all of this are deceiving others, but they're also deceived in their own deception. Yeah. J.B. Phillips' translation says, he makes this poignant paraphrase. Um, I, don't, I think we got, do we have that one? slide? So he says, their wickedness has earned them they're earned then an evil end, and they will be paid in full. So have no fear. God sees it all. Verse 14, chapter 2, having eyes full of adultery, basically unfaithfulness, and they cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices, uh, which is lust and greed, and are accursed children. So Peter continues to put the bright spotlight on these false 
teachers, this insatiable appetite and this lust. They can't even look at a female without going bonkers. They have no control, no self-control whatsoever, and they want to teach others to have the same thing. So, you know, the old saying that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Well, these bad guys are not equipped and they're not called. So, so Peter's just railing on them. Jesus said this, In Matthew, Matthew's gospel, speaking about the eyes and what we see and what we take in, he said in Matthew chapter 6, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, if therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So Jesus kind of shines his light on this, and what happens is, ultimately, is, is when we fall into sin, unrepentant sin, then, then, then we really begin to have, make cloudy decisions. We make dumb decisions. We make things, we, th- we can't hear from the Lord. We can't really know what's going on next. We, it's hard to have peace. It's hard to be settled. You, know, you can be in the midst of chaos, and we've all been there, yet still have peace. So when you're in the midst of chaos, you can't get peace. So the Lord wants us to have peace because He's the Prince of Peace. He wants to bless you and keep you and cover you. The vision for God's life, for, for, for God in your life, is powerful. So if you need prayer for anything, I want to encourage you to come on up at the end of the service. We have people who love Jesus and can come together with you and go to the throne of grace boldly and and touch the Lord and uh, and come together with you. Verse 15 says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of um, this false teacher, Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages, the reward of unrighteous or wicked behavior. These false teachers are continually, this active present tense, abandoning and leaving behind or wandering the straight and narrow. Jesus said this about the straight and narrow. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father but by me. Now, verse 15 says this, Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages or the reward of unrighteousness, this wickedness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity, um, a dumb donkey. You say, a dumb donkey. Do you, do you guys remember the story? speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. So this really worldly guy by the name of Balaam was hired by this heathen king called Balak and uh, to curse Israel. But God dealt with him and kind of straightened him out a little bit and got his motives. But then he, then he, then he fell off the, the track and he you know, went on the wide road and God said, nope, I'm bringing you on this road. It's going to be a narrow road. And I'm going to have a donkey tell you to back off, buddy. And, uh, and he did. And I don't know about you. Um, I walk, I, I, I try to walk four or five times a week. And uh, I, I kid you not, I walk by a donkey. This guy, that, th- th- there's a road that I go through. It's kind of the country. And uh, this one place has horses. But this other one just got a donkey. And if you guys have ever seen a donkey before, so it's really weird. I, I listen to the word regularly, and when you hear the donkey and you walk by a donkey, you can picture, it's easier to picture, that donkey talking to you. It's like, hey, Bob, how are you this morning? That would freak me out. Wouldn't it freak you out? I mean, so, so, we, re, so, we, re, huh, so we read, so this is what we do. We read over something like this. And we dismiss it like it's not a big deal. Oh, a nice story. But it's the real deal. It was a real donkey speaking to a real person. So that just shows God can supernaturally speak to you and I through anything. He's probably not going to send you a letter or a postcard or an email, but he might send an angel unawares. He might send somebody, and my wife's got story, a story about that. I know that God can send somebody to encourage you and help equip you and change what's going on in your life, and you don't know if it's an angel or not. Yeah. Verse 17 said, these are wells without water. These deep words, these empty messages are wells without water. If you can look down there and see, you know, guys, you drop that thing, and psh, you hear a splash. No, this is, and then dust comes from it. Wells without water and clouds like this mist carried by a tempest. Tempest is this dark, dreary storm reserved for the blackness or the darkness forever. 
So Peter describes metaphorically that these false teachers have this dream, these, these flattering words that are enticing some people, taking advantage of them. They're bloodthirsty, they're useless, they're empty, dried up, and pompous, but God's going to deal with them. So this is what we've looked at so far. The destructive heresies of false teachers, the doom of false teachers, the depravity of false teachers, and then we're going to look at now the deceptions of false teachers, and this is where we're going to finish our study, is the deception. So verse 18 says, For when they, these false teachers, speak great swelling words of emptiness, this is vain people, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. So these false teachers are proclaiming these great swelling words, arrogant and boastful. Like I said, they're just a bag of hot air, windbags. Verse 19, while they promise liberty, we know liberty is freedom, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Some, some of your versions say depravity. For by whom a person is um, defeated or overcome by him also is brought into bondage. So these promises are present tense, meaning what, what it's like, uh, they, they lied yesterday, they lied today, they're going to lie tomorrow, just lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. William Barclay writes this, um, to, to, this to this point. I think we have a slide for that one. Yep. So Christian liberty always carries danger. Paul tells his people that they have false teachers, indeed been called to liberty, but they must not use it for an occasion for the flesh. If you look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he, he deals with that. But serve one another. Um, Peter, of course, we just wrote basically saying, Peter tells his people that indeed they are free, but they must not use their freedom as a cloak for maliciousness, because God won't be mocked. So ultimately, these false teachers are offering freedom from sin, but they're in the, the, the like, like a pig, um, just terrible, terrible mess. Verse 20, for if after they, these false teachers, but possibly the victims as well, because they use the word they there, because I identify it, if it's the false teachers or it's the people who've been scammed or, or both have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They are, again, entangled, if you can picture this, like mangled up mess in them and overcome the latter, and in the worst is, uh, it's worse for them than in the beginning. And so these false teachers are not born-again believers, um, victims possibly as well. Maybe, maybe some of them are born-again believers and they just haven't really got to the place where they really know um, what's happening, and um, they're entangled in, they're overcome, and it's, it's, you know, it's basically finding out um, about some kind of truth um, later on, and you see what kind of mess you're in, you repent, and you, and you get cleaned up. But these people are so caught up in it that they, they, they don't have a clue. And what, what I, what I want to, I don't think I have time to share the parable of the sower, but the parable of the sower basically talks about four types of soil. Maybe I can look at, yeah. So the parable of the sower kind of points to, you know, sometimes we wonder if they were saved or not. So salvation really is found in the first soil. Jesus tells this parable about uh, the sower throwing the seed. The seed is the word of God. And um, the, the place that the seed lands is on the hard ground. And he, and he explains, you know, this parable to him later on. And, and, and he says that um, it's plucked up and completely useless. So the person who hear it just blew it off. And in the rocky ground, as people walk on it and trample on it, it might spring up a little bit, but then, you know, the trial comes and boom, they're gone. And the next one is the thorny ground where it, sure, it grows up, but it gets caught up in the cares and the worries of the world. And then finally, the good ground, it's good soil. It, it, it's, it's people who are living for Jesus and they're, 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 they're making fruit. So ultimately, what we have here is this one is definitely not saved, not born again. This one is definitely born again. Now, these two right here, if you want to start a fight with theologians, you say these are not saved or they are saved. So what I say is that if you use your discretion, you see sometimes people will spring up and hearing about Jesus and leave the church and then come back. And then leave the church and then come back. And you say, are they really saved? 
are they really born again? And in these, these people, they're so caught up in the cares and the worries of the world, they come to church and they do all these kind of things, but they just aren't getting it. And you think, are they really saved? Are they really not saved? So that's not up for, it's not up to us to really make that determination. But the determination that we do want to make is that if people are like these false teachers, that you deal with them. And if someone is causing dissension or division or decisive, divisive, if you have all these things going on, then you have to deal with people like that. And um, I think God, God's Word teaches us how to do that. Amen? So the last verse, I'm sorry, second to the last verse, for it would have been better for them not to know the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. I'm going to read that again so you, so you guys are just get this super crystal clear. For it would have better, been better for them, if we look at the four, the four um, perils of the soil, and we know that the first one is gone, and the, the other one is a sure bet, and the other two. So maybe we're looking at those other two people that really don't, we're not sure about. So it would have been better for them to have known than to turn from the holy commandment. Basically the people that said, said yes to Jesus, but then they're saying no thanks anymore. So were they born again? Were they not? We believe, we take the position that we, we, don't, we believe when someone's saved, they're always going to be saved. And you could argue with me on that one. That's okay, but that's what I, I believe. So I want to illustrate, perhaps, so that you can experience and know, maybe understand um, what this might feel like on a very small level. Um, I know when I was in high school, um, I loved playing football. Um, had the killer instinct. I like to be a linebacker, and I was running back. I was a little guy, but I was stupid, fearless, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I'm surprised my neck's not broken. I'm not a wheelchair. But I love football, but I loved even more. I love wrestling. You know, my dad took me to a wrestling match in in, in high school. I, I remember the guys rolling around, and I was like, "Whoa, I want to be a wrestler someday." And I really, uh, really learned to get pretty good at it. And I think what what ultimately happened was um, I I started to notice girls in about fifth grade. I had a gorgeous fifth grade teacher. She had blonde hair. I thought, wow. So I started getting distracted, and I didn't do very good in school. So as you can imagine, it didn't get better. It got worse. So I was probably like maybe top 10 in my class of about 200, but I kind of hit the middle mark there when I, when I was in high school. So when I got in high school, there was a Christmas, a Christmas wrestling tournament that I was in and I was excited about. And um, I just really was aggressive. And I, you know, I didn't know there was a, a talent scout in the room. And um, he saw the match that I had. I just was vicious and I, and I won the match. I didn't, I didn't win the tournament. I took second place. But I know that he noticed it. And then I come to find out this guy wanted to give me a scholarship to wrestle in college. So here's where the story now leads to. Um, that was in December, and then um, about a, a little less than a year later, I went to that college because he got me in there. My grades were horrible. I couldn't, it was like a, it was a, you know, a two-year school, get my associate's degree, but I, when I got there, um, I went to uh, a wrestling practice, and, um, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, man, there's some furious, furious dudes here, and I said, so I want to, like, beat myself up and lose weight, or do I want to party? <laughs> You know what I did? I partied. So for years, I've felt guilty. One is that I blew off a guy who got me into college. It's bothered me. And then just about a month ago, I found out that the coach of this wrestling team had the second highest number of wins in all of college wrestling. So... I've been bothered by not having become like a really high-level wrestler. I found out that I could have been coached by one of the best America has ever seen. So it would have been better for me to not know that, Maynell I think was his last name, to know that this wrestling coach, so now it pains me all the more. So with that illustration, what Peter is talking about here is they heard the good news and they went like this to the Lord. And they're going to be rewinded, they're going to be reminded everything that they heard, everything that they knew, just like the pain that I feel of a simple little thing, and it's simple, 
but it's still annoying. That's what's going to happen with these people. They're going to have regrets. So for anybody in this room today that is listening to my voice and you don't have a relationship with the living God, you need to surrender today because if you don't, this might be the last opportunity you have to say yes to Jesus. I'm trying to scare the hell out of you. And I'm not saying that in a curt way, a disrespectful way, but I'd rather try and scare the hell out of you and perhaps wake you up, you know, like the, the, the donkey speaking, <laughs> pardon, what does that do to me? That you trust Jesus as your Lord because he loves you, cares for you, has a plan for you, has a purpose for you, and your life will change. Amen? Verse 22, and this world will wrap it up, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow having washed to a wallowing mire. And we know uh, that that needs no explanation. So again, chapter 2, um, in summary, we saw that um, there was a warning, this danger. Peter saying danger, 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 and warning for the, Christ, the growing Christian. There is heresy everywhere. And he talked about the destructive heresies of false teachers. He talked about the doom of these false teachers. He talked about the depravity of these false teachers. And he talked about the deceptions of these false teachers. And basically, it's a warning for us to make sure you know who you're learning and growing together with. Next week, we're going to talk about the growing Christian, 2 Peter chapter 3, and a desire um, for this deep well, this, this fresh water that comes out of the well in the knowledge that Jesus is coming back. I'm really glad Jesus is coming back. And what that does is stirs up hope. Because we live in a, in a, in a world that if you, if, you, if you turn on the news, you know, you know, old politics this and old politics that, or, you know, you know my, my, just what, it's, it can really bring you down. So we need to focus on Jesus. Jesus is coming back. Amen? Amen? He is. And I think he's making his bride ready for that departure. And if he's not, preparing for the worst. I'm hoping for the best, but I'm preparing for the worst, and we should prepare for the worst. We should be ready. Persecution is coming. So I'm going to come back up in a minute, and if you have not trusted Jesus as your Lord, that's what we're going to talk about. But first, we're going to sing one more worship song and praise the Lord, and we'll come up and pray, pray the service out. God bless you.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Oh, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. Love from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for the work you've done in hearts and minds today. I pray you continue to move and work in our lives as we advance your kingdom and we grow stronger in our relationship with you and that pours out into our relationship with others. I pray against the work of the enemy. We know how busy he is and how brutal he can be, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and that would be the Holy Spirit. So help us to move and act and live in a way that glorifies you lives lives of faith. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. And God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks a lot for coming today. Sorry for running over.